Thank you. That was way too kind. I'm uh, really happy for the um, invitation. I want to um, tell everyone I'm honored to be here, and uh, I have nothing to to disclose for this presentation. So while we start, uh, I we started presenting about this is that you know abdominal pain is one of our most common complaints in pediatrics, um, definitely within the pediatric GI, and every family. Uh, that comes in through our office uh, is interested in finding exactly what thing is making the pain so they can actually remove it and have the pain go away. And everyone's hopeful that that thing they're going to remove is something they didn't really like in the first place. And over time, I've had a hard time telling these people what to remove and what effects this food have on, on the abdominal pain because the data and the research were lagging. And I'm very excited in this um, era over the past couple of years, they've been amazing work done on the function of foods and their role in symptoms of abdominal pain. Okay, so as I was saying, um, there's been a great research and um, I focused this talk in um, research paper and wanna keep it evidence-based, of course. So adverse reaction for foods are a common complaint. About 45% of the general population complain of an effect of food in their system, and up to half of these affected are actually from the GI tract. These foods are offenders, triggered foods, culprit foods, dietary triggers, but the issue is families stop giving this to their kids, which actually can lead to nutritional deficiencies, and that is where we actually need to be concerned and get involved. And even though the food intolerance is a common perception, actually just um, the minimal amount actually can stand the challenge of the double blind food elimination and re-challenge. So most of these are more perceived than real. And over time, us as a population have been obsessed about food and what's the best food and what's the worst food and it's been fats over the years and we have a Time magazine from um, 1973 and I have a Time magazine from 2013 and there's a lot of them in between each one of them to say what should we do, what should we eat now, what should we don't eat at this point. But does food cause symptoms or does it not? And the short answer is yes, food does cause symptoms. Um, they can cause symptoms by immunologic, like having IgE dependent, like anaphylaxis, IgE associated or cell mediated, like atopic dermatitis or eosinophilic esophagitis, which we'll hear about this next uh, with Dr. Marcus. Um, cell mediated, dietary protein enterocolitis, protein proctitis, as well as celiac disease, but not everything is immunologic. We have also non-immunologic ways of food causing symptoms, which is infection, food poisoning. You can have a pharmacologic effect in foods with histamine, caffeine, um, and also metabolic when you're lacking an enzyme, like um, lactose intolerance or galactosemia or any other metabolic problems. So food can cause symptoms both by the primary effects of the food, the osmotic, chemical, mechanical properties of the food, and even by the secondary effects of the food by saying the fermentation products, the change in the pH, as well as the microbiome effects. But that's not the whole story, because also when you add it to changes in motility, visceral hypersensitivity, immune activation, um, permeability, this could actually can actually trigger the IBS symptoms of bloating, alter bowel movements, and pain. So how do we get IBS? So the recipe for IBS is psychosocial abnormalities, motility abnormalities, sensory abnormalities, and CNS processing abnormalities in somebody that's genetically predisposed. Usually you get a sensitizing medical event, and you turn a happy bowel into a very angry bowel, and they develop a lot of pain. So. The Rome 3 criteria for pediatrics shows that IBS is abdominal pain of discomfort with associated change in bowel habits. The way I always describe it is that IBS is not all belly pain. If you have belly pain and it's affected with any pooping, either you're pooping too much, too little, not enough, it relieves it when you poop, it's worse when you poop, that's IBS when it's associated with defecation problems. And patients that have IBS feel that food does exacerbate and change their symptoms. Now, the actual proportion, we have to be careful, that actually is associated with IgE, is non-to-negligible on patients that have IBS. 
So because of this, it's very common to have our patients and their families experiment with foods, dieting and limiting, and continuing to restrict more and more and more, even before they seek medical attention. So I'm going to go a little bit through this process, and I'm going to start touching just a little bit on the immunologic process, because I really you know, want to focus more on the IBS part of it. So up to 25% of the population in the US believes they actually have a food allergy. But the real um, incidence, it's more about 4 to 8% of children and 1 to 4% of adults. So up to 90% of this presumed food allergies are actually either food intolerances or food aversions. Because a food allergy is something that's immunological mediated, but it's also something that's reproducible. And it can be both IgE or non-IgE. And the formation of antibodies does not necessarily mean symptoms, and symptoms do not necessarily mean the formation of antibodies. So the way to really diagnose a food allergy is the double-blind, placebo, control full challenge, which is the gold standard. Even when you do the single-blind, open food challenge, it's not the gold standard, and it's still subject to uh, placebo response. So you should not recommend when a patient just has abdominal pain to test both IgE or IgG testing because there's absolutely no evidence that says that this is helpful, that it's going to change in symptoms, or that there's actually affect any of their symptoms for abdominal pain. Moving on to gluten. Gluten has been the new villain. It's been vilified uh, across the United States and Europe. Um, you can find multiple uh, problems in the media and that gluten is the responsible for every single malady in the world today. And because of this, many individuals actually become gluten-free in the hopes of improving their variety of both GI and non-GI symptoms, which is a problem for us because it confounds testing when we actually want to test for celiac disease if someone has been on a self imposed elimination diet. Actually, papers show that 62% of adults before going to the doctor have already uh, converted to a gluten-free diet in the hope of controlling the symptoms. And the truth is that a lot of the celiac disease symptoms actually overlap with the IBS symptoms. The proportion of households that are buying gluten-free in 2013, it's 11% up from 5% in 2010. And if you can see, which is really interesting to me, when you walk down the supermarket, products that never ever have contained gluten or actually have anything to do with gluten are actually being advertised as gluten-free because it's the new buzzword and that's what's going to get people to grab that bag and actually buy it. When in fact, you know, the potato that's gluten-free, peanuts that's gluten-free. In fact, so the market actually is about 20% of the population, with only a very minority of this being celiac disease. Great news for celiac disease patients. It's been a lot for them, and it's actually very helpful. But why is there so much fat? Because it's a $23 billion industry. And when the consumer is there, there <laughs> there's going to be people who are going to be right there with there if 30% of the population chooses to buy something. It actually, the top selling gluten flea items are snacks, not even actually on the other food. So they actually, when you break it down, more people are actually buying gluten free snacks. So let's meet the villain. What's gluten? Gluten is really a complex of water soluble proteins that are in grains, both wheat, rye, barley, uh, and it's their main storage protein. And yes, it's true, gluten is only partially digested, and there are certain peptides from gluten that are resistant to digestion. But gluten is not the whole story for wheat. Wheat, yes, has gluten, and it's our main protein, but also has alpha amylase and trypsin inhibitors. It has carbohydrates. It has long-chain non-starch polysaccharides, and it has fructans. Fructans are a chain of a lot of fructose, and at the end, a glucose. If it's less than 10, it's called fructans. If it's more than 10, it's called inulin. And these are carbohydrates that we do not possess the enzyme to break down and actually absorb. So these are carbohydrates that will remain in our bowel and go to our colon. Also, gluten, sorry, wheat has lectin and wheat germ agglutinin, which in vitro, not in vivo, have shown to be pro-inflammatory. <laughs> 
So celiac disease is an immune mediated disorder that happens in genetically predisposed individuals when they're exposed to gluten. These are HLA, DQ2 and DQ8 and there is inflammation of this, of the small bowel, where you have intraepithelial lymphocytosis, you have crypt hypertrophy, as well as villous uh, atrophy. So what happens is gliadin gets deaminated by tissue transglutaminase. This ends up being in the antigen presenting cell that through HLA DQ2 or DQ8 presents gliadin to the CD4 cell and this is what creates the inflammation that causes the destruction and the inflammation of the small bowel. So in patients that actually have celiac disease, as little as 50 milligrams is generally to be considered the minimum gluten needed to induce damage in the lining of the small intestine. If you grab a whole wheat bread, 50 milligrams of gluten is 1 8th, 1 80th of a slice. So why is this important? Why should we diagnose patients with celiac? Well, because it has repercussions. The biggest one is, if you have celiac disease, in my mind, you don't have a choice. It's the difference between the have to and the want to be gluten-free. It's okay if you want to be gluten-free, but if you have celiac disease, you have to be gluten-free. Why? Because we want to prevent the long-term complications, which are not benign. Malignancy, infertility, osteoporosis, and there's also implications on screening of first-degree relatives, where if you do have celiac disease, we want to screen them to make sure we actually catch these cases early. So it's important to know that wheat allergy is not the same thing as celiac disease, and it's not the same thing as gluten intolerance or gluten sensitivity, which in fact, that term should not be used. The term gluten intolerance is nowhere to be found because really it should be termed wheat intolerance or wheat sensitivity, if at all, because it's more to the story, as we saw, than just gluten. So this non-celiac wheat sensitivity, what is it? The definition is easy if you read it. It's those patients that have GI symptoms that when they go wheat-free, the symptoms go away, and when you reintroduce wheat, the symptoms come back. There is questionable, it's still not proven, intestinal permeability or stimulation of lamina propria macrophages. There is this paper in 2013 that showed that some patients with IBS diarrhea had inflammation and increased bowel permeability. The problem with this study is some of these patients were HLA, DQ2, DQ8 positive, and some of them even had positive antibody testing, which is a positive screening for celiac, and a MARSH1 or 2, which is actually changes on the small bowel. So the question is, I don't think he was analyzing normal patients, he was analyzing celiac disease patients as creating a permeability problem when exposed to gluten. The the paper that spearheaded in science the wheat sensitivity is this one right here. It's actually a pretty well done paper. It's 34 subjects, IBS Rome 3 criteria. They were all asymptomatic when they were on a gluten free diet. And they were randomized to either receive 16 grams of gluten versus uh, placebo with around the same baked foods. It's interesting to note that they did a good job screening patients that were not celiac disease. And between them two, there was no difference in the antibodies that you do for celiac testing. There was no change in permeability or in inflammatory markers. But what there was a uh, different in symptoms. Those that had gluten had actually increased symptoms as opposed to those who did not. And this was statistically significant for a lot of symptoms. This paper concluded that non-celiac gluten intolerance may exist, but there were no clues to the mechanism. Now, they did what all good scientists should do. Instead of sitting down and glorifying on the wheat sensitivity, they made even a better study to tease out what was causing the symptoms. So this group followed up that study with this study. What they did was they still grabbed the one week baseline period of those IBS patients that were symptomatic on gluten and went off the gluten-free diet. After that, they introduced them to the FODMAP diet. So they were two weeks off gluten and off FODMAPs. And they all felt better. They were all asymptomatic. 
After that, they were randomized to three treatments. They all completed the three treatments. And it was random which one you start first that had either 14 grams of whey, 2 grams of gluten, or 16 grams of gluten. The difference this time is their gluten was carbohydrate depleted. There were no fructans in their gluten. And they did a reintroduction of a three-day re-challenge with 16 gluten, 16 whey, and no protein to tease out the effect of protein. So what did they find? Overall, the symptoms got worse in each diet regardless of what they were on. Whether they were on gluten, high gluten, low gluten, or even placebo, all their symptoms got worse. There was absolutely no difference on gluten or not. They actually found that six participants had increase in symptoms on gluten on the seven-day challenge, and then two had them on the three-day challenge. The funny thing is, they were not the same people. Nobody had consistent reaction to gluten or any diet. Actually, even more interesting is this. This is separated between whether they were the first diet, second diet, or third diet. And everybody was way more symptomatic on the first diet than on the other ones, regardless of which diet it was, showing a high anticipatory effect or a high nocebo response. So the reduction in the FODMAP did decrease the symptoms. But the symptoms worsened within the study, regardless of they had 0, 2, or 16 grams of gluten. So gluten may really not be causing the symptoms. It might just be the fructans in the wheat causing the symptoms. And they show high nocebo response. So does wheat cause symptoms? I think yes, because they have poorly absorbed carbohydrates. That excess fructans have fermentation with gas production and short-chain fatty acid formation. There is definitely a nocebo effect. As for this side, of the permeability, I think it's still in question, and studies need to prove that further. So far, I don't think they've been 100% there. So we're talking about this fruct fructans and these carbohydrates. What happens? Well, when we're not absorbing our carbohydrate appropriately, we are going to have them fermented by our flora and our colon. And when they ferment it, they're going to create hydrogen, methane, CO2, and short-chain fatty acids. So carbohydrates, really, we only pass through the intestine if they're monosaccharides, the glucose, galactose, and fructose. When you're disaccharides, or even more complex, we need enzymes to break them down so they can actually pass through. For example, lactose needs lactase to break it into glucose and galactose. And what's interesting is a third of patients with IBS are lactose intolerant, but so are a third of controls. Why? Because, yes, lactose deficiency is an, it's a dose-related effect. It's not that you have just a little bit of lactose or nothing. It has to do with your genetics. You have to do with how much enzyme it is. And yes, you can overpower it. But there's more to the story than that. There is visceral hyperalgesia, and there are different processes of how we actually tolerate gas and other processes than just tell the story. Fructose also can be found as fructose, sucrose, or the fructans. And these are uh, the um, fructans or the inulins, which are fructose ending in a glucose molecule. They can be found in wheat, rye, barley. And also, we have a lot of fructose nowadays in our high fructose corn syrup, which is everywhere. The thing is, high fructose corn syrup, it's usually coupled with glucose. Why they do that? Because when you grab fructose and glucose, it's going to get absorbed better, and you're rarely going to have symptoms. So we can all keep drinking our big gulps and actually do not have as many symptoms for the fructose because glucose helps it get absorbed. So fructose by itself is not a great transport, and a lot of people have fructose problems. So it's more likely to have a malabsorption of fructose when it's taken along as opposed when it's associated with glucose. The fructans, we do not have the hydrolase to digest them. So they're going to remain and go into the intestine. And it's great because it actually feeds the good bacteria. Our good bacteria in the colon eat fructans, not only fructans, but also the galacto-oligosaccharides. So, which most of them are in legumes. And this, again, we cannot digest it, but our bacteria loves them. And these are increasingly being added to foods as a prebiotic that does not increase bulk in the food. So a lot of foods out there have galactoligosaccharides. So what do they do? So they did a great study in patients that were healthy using MRI. So 
This is glucose. This is fructose by itself, glucose with fructose and fructans. And you can see how the water content in the small bowel is significantly increased with fructose by itself. And that, yes, glucose and fructose as well as fructans do increase it a little bit as well. The same study now looked at gas in the colon with the same three, um, sorry, the same four um, substrates. And we can see how fructans, when they give inulin, have a statistically significant increase in gas in our intestine. The last thing that we are going to talk about as a substrate today will be the polyols, which they can also be fermented and increase gas. And these are sugar alcohols. This can actually be absorbed by passive diffusion, but there's in fruits, vegetables, but what's important is that it's here in many processed foods and candies, especially the sugar-free. Uh, we're going to have a lot of, this, of the sorbitols, which actually can have um, a lot of symptoms. So when we have sucrose has to be broken between fructose and glucose and be absorbed. Lactose has to be broken by galactose and glucose by lactase so they can be absorbed. Whatever is left and it's not appropriately absorbed first is going to have an effect of increased intraluminal water in the small bowel. But all of these are going to end up obviously in the colon creating gas and short chain fatty acids. And we do not manage gas the same. And that's part of where the variability becomes. So this is a study done on a patient with IBS on a CT scan. And what you see here in light blue inside is the gas. So patients that have bloating actually do not have a lot of increased gas per se inside of them. They actually have bloating with only 22 mL difference in the increase of gas. Why? Because their diaphragm goes down and their belly goes out. Very different than the pseudo-obstruction patient that baseline has a high amount of gas and an acute pseudo-obstruction episode can actually increase up to three liters of gas. The difference is the belly on the outside might look the same, but on the inside, the diaphragm is up accommodating more gas. So the actual patient bloating does not necessarily mean that there's way more gas there. It's all of it how their diaphragm rests. So the functional bloating is more of an abdominophrenic displacement more than actual true increase in intestinal gas as if in a organic disease. So the ones I've introduced you before, I've been walking you through the FODMAPs and the latest uh, diet to help with um, pa patients with abdominal pain is the low FODMAP diet. So it was introduced in 2005 as an adjuncting therapy for patients that have IBD. They pretty much restrict everything I talk to you about because if you restrict it, it's not going to go to the colon. It's not going to be fermented. You're going to have less gas. Therefore, you're going to have less symptoms because there's going to be less bowel distension, less pain, less bloating, less gassiness. So how does the FODMAP work? Their bacterial fermentation has gas, shortening fatty acids, also change the pH, which change the microbiome, which changes motility, visceral sensation, um, permeability. There's actually osmotic effects. There's increased osmotic load. And all of these exacerbate pain, gas bloating, and altered bowel movements. So what does FODMAP stand for? Fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So the oligosaccharides are going to be your fructans and your galacto oligosaccharides. Your disaccharides is lactose. The monosaccharides is fructose. And the polyols are the polyols. So do, does this work? Yes. Uh, the randomized controlled study, 30 patients with IBS, they were randomized either a low FODMAP diet or a regular Australian diet. Can you guess where the study was done? So 21 days or baseline, those patients that have IBS, these are their baseline symptoms. With the FODMAP, they decreased. Now, healthy patients that had absolutely no GI symptoms, no symptoms before, no symptoms after. So on the IBS, decreased bloating, abdominal pain, as well as passage of wind 
and the normal individuals develop no symptoms. So this is not a healthy diet if you don't have any symptoms. It's not going to change absolutely anything. Now, if you do have IBS, it's going to improve your symptoms, but it does improve them within seven days. The beauty about this diet is if by a week or two weeks you've not seen any difference, you don't need to keep doing it. You're not going to see anything afterwards. The problem is complex and it's restrictive. In your handout, I put in what has high FODMAP, what has low FODMAP. It is not intuitive. It's a hard diet to shop because there's some vegetables that are, some that are not, some fruits that are, some fruits that are not. It's a very complex diet that requires a dietitian to really keep it nutritionally complete and a very driven family that's really going to follow up. So the goal is to get them on a FODMAP diet for a couple of weeks when they're feeling better and then introduce one of the groups at a time to see if we can identify which of the groups they're more susceptible for and they don't have to avoid all FODMAPs but just the FODMAP that makes their symptoms worse. Moving from the FODMAP not too far to fiber. There is an, also an obsession on fiber. The recommendations are just eat what you should eat of fiber. More fiber can actually create more problems. There's difference from soluble to insoluble. If you're going to choose, choose insoluble, uh, choose soluble fiber because the insoluble one actually produces bacterial fermentation, which again provokes bloating, abdominal distension, and pain. And it's important when we prescribe it not to just do a sudden increase in fiber intake because it's going to be, have symptoms. So there is such thing as too much fiber. So it should be started at small doses. You should slowly tritate it over the course of a week. And even under the best circumstances, fiber can exacerbate problems with distension, flatulence, constipation, and diarrhea. So take home points. Although food intolerance is common, really few of it actually meets the challenge of actually a true intolerance. But it is true, food actually can cause GI symptoms and change abdominal sensation. And it does it through um, the changes both in the microbiota, changes in motility, um, you know, there's CNS processing process, it's a multifactorial, it's not as easy as just one thing. I mean, because you have abdominal pain, cramping, <coughs> bloating, urgency, and diarrhea. So we should use wheat sensitivity rather than gluten sensitivity. And this still is an entity awaiting validation. Does it really exist beyond the FODMAP? Some people say it still does, even beyond FODMAP. Some people say it doesn't. That's still to be elucidated over the next couple of years. We need to acknowledge the other parts of gluten, sorry, of wheat. Gluten is not the whole story. FODMAPs are definitely problematic with those patients with IBS. So there is now a primary role for a diet for the treatment of IBS. Now, given the complexity, I think it's best undertaken under the assistance of a trained dietitian. And it's interesting, the public is definitely interested in getting fixed with a diet. And they're looking for guidance. If we're not interested in giving that guidance, the internet, Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz are going to take that job from us. <laughs> so it's better for our patients to hear it from us and well-educated sources of diet than to have them go in internet and find information on themselves. So with that, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.